Well, thanks to everyone for coming and being patient the last uh, while. I don't know when people started lining up, but I guess it's been a while since you got here, so uh, I appreciate that. Um, uh, of course, my daughter was very good to say, Dad, don't get carried away. There's free food. That's a good reason for people. <laughs> Students will find free food. Um, uh, in lecturing on a topic such as this, I think of a chapter written by one of the pioneers in this field of uh, relationship science, Ellen Burscheid, who said, one of the challenges we face is that people come to us and say, oh, can you diagnose my relationship? Uh, should my boyfriend and I get married? And what the person is asking for is an actuarial prediction. And she said, because relationships matter, people want to know these things. And she said, we're uh, set to this standard when she talks to her colleagues in other areas of science and engineering and says, oh, I've just walked into your kitchen. Tell me when the water is going to boil, the exact second. And my colleague says to me, oh, well, that's a little difficult because we have to take account of the materials and the nature of the pot and the water and the environment. And they'll give you about seven different variables. But if you come to my lab, I can tell you. And she said, unfortunately, people want to know in the real world uh, how to uh, forecast their relationships. So uh, I think we've made a few advances, but um, there are limits to that actuarial prediction. What I'd like to do before getting into the talk itself, I'd like to try a little exercise with you. If you'd bear with me. I'd like you to close your eyes. This may seem strange, but uh, <laughs> it really makes a difference. Students who had me for class know this. Close your eyes. Think of a situation in the past few years when you felt threatened or scared. Maybe you were sick. You thought you had some illness. Maybe it was a situation that was physically threatening. Someone was intimidating you. Or maybe it was a failure experience or pressure from someone to do something. Choose a situation such as that where you were on your own facing that difficulty. And I want you to picture the scene. See the surroundings of that scene. I want you to try to get in touch with how you feel in that situation. Keeping your eyes closed, I'd like you to now think of someone in your life who's the go-to person for you, the person you can count on, you can turn to. You could think of who that is. I now want you to picture that person with you in that scene. OK, thank you. You can open your eyes. I'm going to now talk for 50 minutes on the, uh, all sorts of topics about love. What does the average person think when they mean, uh, when they think of the concept of love? What is the look of love? The language of love? Then I'm going to have a brief sidebar on physiology. As Ingrid's announcement said, I was going to do something about psychology and physiology of love. I, so I thought, well, I guess I should take a couple minutes for that. But then in the last part of the talk, I'm going to come back to what this visualization was all about. So in one respect, I'm going to give you some sense of all the different ways people think about love. But in another respect, you probably, in the last five minutes, have a sense of what the core of love is really about. So, so bear with me and hang in for the next 50 minutes or so, even though uh, we could sort of cut to the chase right now. Uh, before getting to what people actually think love is, just a bit of historical backdrop. Uh, in the last 150 years, there have been intellectual strands that have helped 
sort of set the table for the science of close relationships. Obviously, Darwin's work emphasizing the importance of reproductive success has spawned not only evolutionary biology, uh, but ideas in evolutionary psychology that are important to uh, understanding mating and relationship maintenance. Freud's work pointed out the importance of childhood experience on shaping an individual across the lifespan. Also, Freud started talking about implicit motives and defenses. And those who've had me for class know that that is a, a big part of experimental <coughs> social psychology, understanding that an awful lot that goes on with us is not just in terms of ex explicit conscious awareness, but there are things that go on at an implicit level, and I'm going to touch on a bit of that today. Uh, Margaret Mead and her work helping us to realize how important culture is and the socialization process. And then one name that many of you probably don't know on that list. Uh, Kurt Lewin, who is considered the founder of experimental social psychology back in the 1920s and 30s, actually had the audacity to think that major social processes could be studied in an experimental fashion. Uh, so all of these have really inspired uh, the work in uh, the science of close relationships in the last 30 or 40 years. So what do people mean when they talk about uh, love? What does the average person mean? If I ask you to think about the concept fruit, the most common image that comes to mind is apple. And apple is thought of as a prototypic fruit. There are other fruits that qualify as fruit, but they don't come to mind as quickly and easily. So what about studying the concept of love that, day, that way? What do we think of? What terms come to mind? So in a study by Beverly Fair at the University of Winnipeg, she instructed people, if you were asked to list the characteristics of a person experiencing terror, you might write possible danger occurs, heart beats quickly, maybe imaginary like a ghost, hands tremble. Make a similar list for the concept love. So Fair's way of approaching research on love was sort of this bottom up to say, well, what do people think? What do people mean by the concept of love? And people generated all sorts of terms. Some were abstract, uh, caring, helping, sharing. Others were types of relationships, parent to child, romantic, friendship, sibling relationship. Uh, people generated. I think it was about 70 different unique features that were reported on by more than just one or two people. Okay? So that was her long list, and that was this sort of bottom-up approach. But an alternative approach, a top-down approach, uh, was taken by Bob Sternberg at Yale, who said, well, what do I think? I'm a smart guy. I do uh, cognitive psychology and now social psychology. Uh, how would I conceptualize love? And that's how we got to the triangle. Uh, Sternberg theorized that there are three key dimensions to love, passion, intimacy, and commitment. And so you could have different types of love, he said, by looking at any of these three points on the triangle. So for example, passion, if there was a passion alone, he said that he described as infatuation or commitment by itself is empty love. But then if you look at the side of the triangle, that side re represents the two points uh, uh, that anchor that side. So you see romantic love is a combination of intimacy and passion. So he generated all these different combinations to say there are different ways we can think of love depending on the mix of passion, intimacy, and commitment. So fair, bottom up, Sternberg, top down. But what I think was especially useful was when someone actually tried to put these two pr approaches together. And what they did, we'll just skip over this, is they took all the features from Fair's analysis and said, could those be conceptualized in terms of Sternberg's dimensions? So they did a statistical procedure called factor analysis and said, it actually works. There's a three-dimension solution 
to all the features from Bev Thayer's prototype analysis. There are passion features such as heart rate increases, euphoria, sex appeal. There are intimacy features, there are commitment features. So that was nice. But what's more useful is the fact that when people do prototype analysis, the first step is to get people to just generate what features come to mind. But the second step is to then go to a separate group of people and say, here are all sorts of features. Rate how central each feature is to the concept of love. And what they found is for the intimacy features, the intimacy features were consistently rated as central to the concept of love. The commitment features, some were rated as central and some less central. The passion features were consistently rated as less central. So by bringing these two methods together, this analysis suggested that although when we think of the concept of love, we may think of passion, intimacy, and commitment. Intimacy may represent what might be most central to people's thoughts of love. Now, is there a look to love? Can we actually see it in the behavior and the gestures of another person? How does a person implicitly signal to another person their love and affection? Well, it seems that the look of love can be captured by things such as affiliative hand gestures, forward leans, head nods, and the Duchenne smile. Now, what is the Duchenne smile? <laughs> so we have on the bottom the Duchenne smile, and on the top, the non-Duchenne smile. Either way, you see a cute baby, but there's a difference in the smile. Now, the people who study this, they had been studying other displays of emotion. And in fact, here's, does anyone know who this is a picture of? Paul Ekman, the man behind the facial coding of emotion. Uh, the man who is also a consultant for the television show lied to me. So Ekman. <laughs> Uh, was the advisor of the person who did this research. So they said, let's get a camera and see if Ekman can do a non-Duchenne and a Duchenne smile. But there's also the look of lust. <laughs> it's not about Duchenne smiles. <laughs> it's lip licks, lip puckers, touching with the lips with one's hands, tongue protrusions. I think I told my students last year the uh, strange experience I had some years back. I had a bicycle accident, and fortunately, a dentist saw me right away, and things were good. And um, you know, even though within the first few days my face was, you know, I broke my nose, two teeth had to be extracted. It was not a pleasant scene. Uh, my colleagues were actually horrified. I was less so because I wasn't looking in the mirror. Uh, <laughs> but a couple of weeks later, uh, I was visiting my family, and my mother is a judger. You know, she's not just a perceiver, she's a judger. And she's like, oh, you know, how are the teeth looking? And this, oh, you know, you've come out of it, okay. And she said, you know, the only thing is, you know, you seem to be licking your lips a lot. And I, of course, I knew about this research, and I thought, oh my God, I'm going into work with the look of lust every day. <laughs> so, so, you know, it's not always a reliable signal, but it does correlate. Now, what the people at Berkeley did with this was they brought couples into the lab. They had them discuss uh, a conflict situation. They had to do another situation where one of them would tease the other person. They videotaped all this. And after each interaction, they had to rate different emotions, including how much love they felt in that interaction. So they had self-reports, how much you're saying you felt love when you were just interacting with your partner. They also had your partner report whether he or she thought you were expressing love. And what they found is both your own report and your partner's report of love correlated with the look of love. So higher numbers mean a higher correlation. The green bar represents the correlation between the look of love and the reports of love. 
And it's important not just that they got this high correlation, but that the correlation is higher than the correlation between the look of love and self-reports of desire and happiness. So it's not simply you're feeling desire for your partner and this is being expressed. It's specific to love. And it's not just, oh, I feel good, I'm happy right now, the look of love. There was something distinctive about that. So that's the look of love. Okay? People also, observers, could reliably distinguish between the look of love and the look of lust. But what about this issue of, I, with that factor analysis, I sort of pushed passion aside. Oh, passion's not central. And now I'm saying, oh, lust isn't the same as love. What about when you're asked the question, oh, I'm so in love with, and fill in the blank. Well, sometimes it's your romantic partner, and sometimes it's, you know, <laughs> people like this, or people like this. And I think that's helpful. I'll go back. There are more women in the room, so they probably want this slide up there. So you look at these people, you say, oh, I'm so in love with that person. I was remembering this some years ago. I was visiting uh, friends of mine, and it was after, I can't remember the actress's name, and from um, um, uh, Russell Crowe is the math genius, and it, oh, Jennifer. Jennifer. So, and he, while his wife is sitting there, he's confessing his love for this actress. And he just said, oh, and she said, yeah, he, he loves her. He loves her. He's in love with her. So, but I think what's helpful is to realize when we say we're in love with someone, that might not mean exactly the same thing. And so I think in a very useful study, uh, Bershaid and her colleagues had people list initials of members of different social categories. And so one category might be uh, people in your neighborhood. Another category may be professors you have. There are lots of ones that were just filler to mask the purpose of the study. The three that they cared about on the list were the initials of people you currently love, people with whom you are currently in love, and people toward whom you feel sexual attraction, desire. And you can imagine, if they only asked those three, uh, most students, this was at the University of Minnesota, they're almost as smart as McGill students. They would probably figure this out and say, oh, right, they want to see the overlap, the relationship between these. So they put it in with some other questions to make it less obvious. And what they discovered is that people will say uh, that they're in love with someone, then they will probably say they also love that person. If I'm in love with someone, I probably love the person, okay? So what that means, but on the other hand, if I love someone, I'm probably not in love with that person. What that means is you might list 10 people you love, but there's only one of them you're going to say you're in love with that person. But most of the time when you put someone down as you're in love with that person, they make your list of the people you love. Okay? And of course, as the women in the room could have bet, there are gender differences. First of all, women have longer lists when they're asked, who do they love? They list more people, and people list more women. So both men and women put more women on their list of the people they love. <laughs> but now you're probably already at bullets three and four, where the men don't come out as men are more likely to be in love with those whom they love. And the reason for that is simple. The women are generating a list of 10 people they love, and they're saying, and one of those I'm in love with. And the guys are listing three people they love, and one they're in love with. So one out of three versus one out of 10. But I think this last bullet is kind of interesting, is that women tend to love the men they sexually desire more than men loving the people they sexually desire. <laughs> So for women, that sexual desire is usually the object of that sexual desire is someone they love. Men can sexually desire all sorts of women. Uh, okay. Of course, 
people in general, and especially the men, uh, desire all sorts of people, and it's not reciprocated. And the way the women were laughing, you probably understand this, thinking, yes, there are guys that I see, and boy, I wish I didn't see them again, but they <laughs> are still there. Well, this is the idea of unrequited love. So as much as we might desire others, as much as we might want to have relationships with others, we know it's not always mutual. One way this happens is uh, people who are friends and some want to become romantic partners. It's also the finding that even though we mate with people who are similar to us in attractiveness, it's not that we want to mate with people who are similar in attractiveness. Th and this was actually a mistake that was being reported years ago. Uh, someone found that if you do these Coke date studies, people who continue on are similar in attractiveness. And they said, ah, people want, people are there saying, oh, I should choose someone who's similar to me. People aren't trying to choose someone who's similar to them. What's happening is they're figuring that's the person who the relationship will last with that person. But if they had their way, they go for the hottest person in the room. Um, and in fact, as I was talking with students of mine at lunch today, this has implications for things like uh, eHarmony, uh, Plenty of Fish, these websites where people can go and think, well, there are 500 available to me, so why not just keep going till you find uh, the person who's most attractive who'll put up with you. Um, <laughs> but the other feature about the research on unrequited love is not so much that it happens, because we know it happens, but what is the experience for the two people? And what was discovered is that this can be a distressing experience for the recipient of that interest. And the proposal is that the person who's doing the loving, they have scripts available, they're out there, they're engaged, but the other person doesn't want it, and they don't know how to send the message. So what's talked about are things such as the mum effect, where we don't like to communicate to others negative information. So if you think about how your friends, we won't talk about you because you never do this, but how your friends try to put off someone that they're not interested in, what sort of things do they say? They'll say things maybe like, well, you know, it's not a good time for me right now. Uh, of course, the other person's saying, well, maybe next week is a better time. Uh, uh, you know, and it's not you, it's me. And it's like, well, that's okay, I can deal with you. Uh, <laughs> So you keep saying things that you don't want to hurt the other person, but what it does is that person is motivated. They are motivated to form a relationship with you. So if you give them any ambiguous signals, they are motivated to interpret it in a way that meets their goal, which is they want to have a relationship with you. So this mum effect is something that can actually uh, facilitate an ongoing pursuit by the other person and create distress in the recipient uh, of that desire. Okay. okay, I did say I was going to do a little sidebar about physiology. Actually, most of the research in the close relationships field looking at physiology is about mating. It's about initial interpersonal attraction. People in my class know some of these things. That, uh, there's work looking at waist to hip ratios. Um, women with a 0.7 are supposed to be uh, uh, more ideal because they're supposed to be better in terms of reproductive fitness. Faces that convey health and youth are supposed to be more attractive. Uh, there's something called fluctuating asymmetry. And it's not, they measure everything, the ears, the wrists, the ankles, and the more symmetrical the two ankles, the two wrists, everything is supposedly the higher the person is in genetic fitness and therefore the more appealing that person would be. Uh, one comment I'd like to make about these sorts of studies, well two comments I'm going to make. One is about methodology. The methodology involved in some of these studies is significant. So we were going to do a fluctuating asymmetry study and then I started looking at the lengths you have to go to get reliable measures. So you don't just ask someone to measure their own wrists. 
You do that, you will not find anything about fluctuating asymmetry. They have trained research assistants that will measure about six different things three times each. And then even when they get a reliable measure, here's the second part of this, is the effect sizes are what we call statistically significant, but they're very small. So there are a lot of these things that are out there that get in the media that uh, sound interesting, and that's why they're picked up in the media, but the effect sizes are very small. There are so many other things that overshadow it. And the one I'd like to comment on are some of the effects on the menstrual cycle. Uh, last week, I was with a colleague who has done some very interesting research on this. And one of his more recent findings is using the t-shirt paradigm. Some of you may know this. Uh, you can do this in different ways. This particular study, what they did was they had females working in the lab who had to wear a certain t-shirt during the peak uh, when they were ovulating uh, for two nights and then two nights later in their menstrual cycle. And then they bring the t-shirts in and they give it, have male participants put their head and just take, <laughs> you know, sniff hard. Well, there were two findings. The guys actually rate the t-shirts during ovulation they rate the woman as more attractive than when it's later in her cycle. Also, the guy's testosterone goes up when he's sniffing the <laughs> ovulating t-shirt, okay, versus the non-ovulating. But there are a couple of things uh, this colleague of mine was saying about this. First of all, the method, the regimen that these women go through, I said, who, who do you, how much do you pay them? Because they can't use any sort of scented soaps, uh, scented shampoos, uh, scented uh, laundry detergent. They're given sheets to put on the bed to sleep. Uh, they get a whole list of foods they're not allowed to eat during these days. So it's, he said it's very difficult to do this research because the effect is small. As we say, the signal to noise ratio is small, so you have to control for all that noise. But the second part of it, he said, is the media has reported that the conclusion of his research means, oh, when women are ovulating, they're better off with their natural scent than with perfume. And he said, that's interesting. I've never studied that. <laughs> he said, I have no idea how the effect of the t-shirt compares to other scents. He said, all I know is the natural scent during these two days is different than the natural scent during those other two days. So, but there is one bit about physiology I do want to talk about for a minute or two, and that's about oxytocin. Oxytocin is thought of as the love hormone. This is a quote from the New York Times. Above all, be thankful for your brain's supply of oxytocin the small celebrated peptide hormone that by the looks of it helps lubricate our every pro-social exchange, the thousands of acts of kindness that make human society possible. Well, a former graduate student of mine, Jennifer Bartz, has now become the oxytocin lady in social psychology. She's done a number of studies uh, where she gives oxytocin intranasal infusion. So she's able to experimentally test the effects of oxytocin on pro-social behavior. So people fill out a bunch of questionnaires one day, a few days later they come back to the lab and they get this inhalation and they don't know which day they're getting oxytocin and which day they're getting a placebo. And across her various studies, what she finds is she gets different effects depending on what she calls where people are in terms of interpersonal sensitivity. So people who are autistic, so she's been doing research with adults who were Asperger's uh, patients, and they come to this center, and giving them oxytocin seems to have a positive effect. But when she gives oxytocin to people with borderline personality disorder, it's not a no effect. It's an opposite effect. It actually has an ironic opposite effect on borderlines. 
She also finds the same thing with people who are anxiously attached. So what she thinks is people who are low in interpersonal sensitivity might benefit from oxytocin to increase their interpersonal sensitivity. But people who are anxiously attached, who are high in sensitivity to rejection, oxytocin may be the last thing you might want to give these people. So that's just one little footnote about physiology. OK. I think I'm in great shape. We'll be finished in a few minutes. I want to shift in the last little bit of today's talk to why love might matter. What does love do? Okay? And in a couple of studies, people have looked at what love does in terms of one's own sense of personal growth. Here is a study where people were asked to describe themselves every two weeks. So they're measuring essentially their self-concept. Who are you as a person? You're doing it every two weeks. Uh, and then what they did was some of these people reported somewhere throughout the term that they fell in love. For some people, it was week two, others week four, others week six. What the researchers were interested in is what do you say two weeks after you fell in love about who you are as a person? And what they found is during that window, shortly after people report falling in love, they experience greater self-concept change. So the notion is that relationships can expand the self, that we see ourselves in broader and richer and more diverse ways. So that was one first step to sort of look at how love can change the self. Uh, another one that I think was interesting here was where they studied students over time, and they assessed how in love they said they were with their partner. But they also asked this question, since our relationship began, I have become more like I would ideally like to be. They were also asked, my, has my partner become more like she or he would ideally like to be? And what they found is the more one person is in love, the more the other person experiences personal growth over the next five months. So when you're with someone and you have that sense, and it may not even be explicit, it might be explicit, they might say that, or it might be, as I was saying earlier in the hour, it may be the look of love, the, those implicit signals the partner is sending. But whatever they're doing, they're sending this message and you understand that you're loved by this other person. And they find this change in terms of people's reports of personal growth. And not only do they see it in themselves, but even the partner can see it. Even the partner can see that the person has experienced this sense of personal So the beginning of the hour, I asked you to think of who your go-to person was. This is something called the who-to scale. They give it to people. And you indicate who is the person you don't like to be away from, who you would count on for advice, et cetera. And the idea behind this is to identify what is called your attachment figure. Who is the person who you're bonded to? Who is the person who makes you feel secure in times of threat? So the notion is that you know, we all have our ups and downs in life. Also, people vary in terms of the quality of their relationships. But most, most people can identify at least one person that they feel is a reliable person who they can count on. Not everyone, but most people can. Even people who worry about their relationships uh, or people who are fearful of relationships, usually they can come up with at least one person who they can count on. And so what attachment research looks at is how this can help protect us in times of threat. So here, people were brought in for a mental simulation task. And Brad is sitting at the computer. And this happens, OK? <laughs> so in one condition, the word failure is flashed on the screen for about 16 milliseconds. And then after that, a nonsense word comes up. And you're supposed to say, is this a word or isn't it a word? Okay? 
You say, oh, that's not a word. It's just a bunch of letters. Let's see if I can get back to that one. Okay, it's just a bunch of letters. Or maybe you'll see a word, like school. Oh yeah, that's a word. Maybe we wouldn't do that with McGill students because that's always on your mind, so we wouldn't want that. So you're doing this failure. Sometimes you get failure, sometimes you get the word hat. But you get failure and then a nonsense word, or failure and then some neutral word. But then sometimes you get failure and Brad gets his partner. So the question they had is when we think of threat, when we think of failure, does that automatically bring to mind our attachment figures? Do our attachment figures become more accessible to us? And that's exactly what they found. So the lower the bar, the faster you recognize that name as a name. And so in the control condition, even in the control condition, people are pretty fast to recognize their attachment figure. So Brad sees Angelina, oh yeah, I know that name. But he's significantly faster to recognize her name when threat or failure was flashed on the screen. Now, what's especially impressive is when you compare that to the next condition. They also had the names of people who you listed as close relationships. People who are in your social network, family or friends, but they're not your go-to people. So these are people who are close to you, who are very much a part of your life, but they're not your attachment figure. They're not your go-to figure. And you don't get the same effect. Failure does not increase the speed at which you recognize those names. And of course, it doesn't increase the speed at which you recognize the names of famous people or of non-words. But it does increase the speed at which you recognize those attachment figures. The other way they looked at this was to use the old famous Stroop color naming task. Those of you who've had cognitive psychology remember this task. You get words, and you see the word R-E-D, but it's in blue. And your task is to say blue. But it's hard to say blue when the letters are R-E-D, because you're thinking red. So you're slower to be able to name the color blue. That's the Stroop color naming task. What's great about that procedure is it can be used for all sorts of things because the idea is if you're trying to name the color but the word is something else that comes to mind to you, you can't just look at color. That word creates what's called interference. Okay? So attachment people use this and said let's subliminally prime people with words like failure or separation to create a threat. Or a control word, like hat, that was the control word. Uh, I think in Israel that was a good word to use, they said, so they used hat. They had personal names, names of attachment figures, but names of other people who are close to you but are not attachment figures. And those names are presented in different colors. Your task is to just say red, blue, green, yellow. But how fast can you say those names? Does threat automatically activate thoughts of an attachment figure? If so, then when you're presented with threat, you'll think of the attachment figure, and when you see that attachment figure's name, you think about the name, and it slows you down naming the color. And so that's what they found. So here, it's the reverse of the previous slide. Here, bigger numbers still mean slower, but the hypothesis was that they would be slower. They're slower to name the color when the color corresponds with their attachment figure, but only when they're primed with failure or primed with separation, not when they're primed with hat. So it's not just, oh, I see my attachment figure, I'm a disaster doing the Stroop test, because the third bar there shows they can do the Stroop test just fine when their attachment figure's name comes up. They cannot do it when they're primed with failure and separation. Okay. So, oh, this is just another example saying 
for those, you're probably sitting there saying, well, yeah, but I have friends who have a hard time coming up with a go-to person. Is there any hope for them? Well, there's actually work showing that you can prime attachment security without having to think of a name of a person. So here you do what we call the scrambled sentence task. You get the words child protected today felt the, and you have to write, make a sentence. And so you make a sentence, the child felt protected. Reliable thought the mother, the mother was reliable. So when you unscramble the words to make grammatically correct sentences, you're making grammatically correct sentences that slip in aspects of attachment security. Reliability, dependability, acceptance. Okay? And so what they find is if people do that, just being, having that chance to think about a sense of felt security can produce effects in terms of dampening people's experience of stress. So I'm going to wrap up with one last attachment study. In this study, they gave people the Hutu. You're asked to list people who you go to in times of need. They find that out in September from students. And then they bring students in in October and November to their lab. And what they do in this case is the subliminal prime is not threat or failure, or separation. The subliminal prime is the name of the attachment figure in one condition. Another condition, the prime is the name of someone else who's close to you but is not your attachment figure. So what they're trying to do is prime that sense of attachment security. And then they want to see, will that influence your willingness to help someone else in time of need? Well, the other person in need is the other student in the experiment. You come to the lab. And you're told, well, this is an experiment on how people perceive the behavior, uh, verbal and nonverbal behavior, of another person. We're going to randomly assign the two of you. One of you is going to go through the task in the other room, and the other is going to be the perceiver. Pull something out, and of course, it's rigged. It's rigged, so you're going to be the perceiver, and the other person's going to the other room. The other person actually works for the experimenter. They go to the other room, and here are the things they're supposed to do. First look at gory photos, then pet the lab rat, then immerse their arm in ice water for 30 seconds, pet the tarantula, touch the sheep's eye, pet the snake, and then they have this big black bag with a skull and bones on it. And you're supposed to put your arm in the bag and allow the cockroaches to crawl on your arm. So you're in this experiment. You're, you're watching. It almost be like the closed circuit room next door. You've got the other person uh, is watching. And now we have this list of things. And what happens is uh, the woman gets to, I think, the third item. And she just she can't handle it anymore. She says, I, I can't do this. I'm an anxious person. You know, I, I'm really sorry. Is there any other way? And the experimenter says, well, you know, hold on. Let me go next door. And the experimenter comes over to see you. Says, gee, she's not doing well. She's finding this very difficult. Um, but I need one of you to do it. You know, it's really important. I, I have to have one of you do it and the other one watch. Uh, will you trade places with her? Well. People who, for just 16 milliseconds, had the name of their attachment figure flashed on the screen were significantly more likely to say, yes, OK, I'll take her place. Okay. So that sense of attachment security was powerful enough to not only affect how they were feeling as an individual, but their ability to help another person. Okay. So, so we see over and over again that this sense of attachment security can be something that protects us in terms of our own stress. And that's some of the work we've done here at McGill showing how, for example, female undergrads we've brought into the lab. We had them visualize themselves facing an unplanned pregnancy. And we knew 
from pretesting, we amped up the stress. You know, 20-year-old, 21-year-old McGill undergrads going through that visualization were not taking a walk through the park. It was stressful. But the ones who were subliminally primed, the attachment figure, experienced significantly less stress and reported more constructive ways in which they would cope with that stressor. So attachment security can help us cope with our own stress, and it can also help us go beyond ourselves to help others. So in conclusion, I'd like to suggest maybe love is not simply a big equilateral triangle, but maybe love is about that affectionate bond. Maybe love is about that sense of intimacy, sharing your true authentic self with that other person. And by doing that, that may help to forge that attachment bond. Because as you share your true self, that can invite that same response from that other person. And as you go back and forth, maybe you share a little bit, and then the other person shares a little bit. And then you share a little more. Because sharing your true self is a risk. So you take a little bit of a risk, and you share some of that private true self. And when that's affirmed, and that other person gets what you're saying, understands what you're revealing about yourself, and accepts you for who you are, then maybe you're willing to share a little more, and that other person's willing to share a little more about themselves. And as that intimate interaction goes back and forth, that can help to forge this bond of attachment, this sense that, oh, I can count on this person. This is someone who knows me, not only knows me, but accepts me and cares about me. And I think that is the core of love. But of course, you're here for Love Actually and watching a film about people in love. Uh, a lot of that probably re refers to that sense of desire, that sense of passion. So being in love probably has those ingredients, but hopefully it might also have the ingredients of love. And then maybe it would be a big equilateral triangle. Thank you very much.